Okay, so on the desk in front of me, there are the traditional red and blue plastic coated magnets. You remember that the magnets themselves are steel. They're just wrapped in this plastic to make them kind of um, robust and durable and so that you can remember which ends which. So at the moment, you can see that when I move one of the magnets around, the other one tracks it. And that's because the blue end is experiencing an attraction towards the red end. If I spin this magnet round and bring the blue end in, you'll see that the blue end of the magnet gets repelled away, and now it's the red end that gets attracted. So there are definite um, parallels here with the electric force that we have just studied. So first things first, it's a non-contact force. You can see that this is happening even though the two objects are separated. Uh, it can both attract and repel, just like the electric force can. And it does reduce with distance. So when I waggle this over here, not really anything happens. But when I bring it nearer to it, it does uh, have an effect on the other magnet. So again, it's a, it's a force that reduces with distance. And so because of the analogies that we've just, these basic ones, with the electric force, we're going to carry on with the route that we went down with the electric force, and that is to represent the strength of the force using a field approach. So if I just bring this over here to another demo that hopefully you have seen before. So underneath this piece of paper, there is a, a, a magnet that I've trapped there. I'm just going to put a piece of paper on top. And then I've got a little um, shaker here that's got some little tiny, tiny little bits of iron in it. You remember that iron is a material that responds to magnetism. And what I'm just going to do is shake the tiny little bits of iron all over the bit of paper. And you can already see that the tiny little bit of iron, the tiny little filings, they've become magnetized themselves near to the magnet, and they started sticking themselves together. Um, and if I just give it a little tap to just let the friction of the paper let go of them just for a second. And you can see this characteristic magnetic field line pattern that we are used to seeing with bar magnets. Um, so at one end, you can see that the, the magnetic force is so strong that it's actually managed to scoop all the little bits of iron off the bit of paper and drag them across the bit of paper, regardless of the friction. That's how strong the force is here. Same at the other end. And then in between, the force has got weaker, so it hasn't managed to drag it across the piece of paper. It hasn't been strong enough to beat the friction. But what it has managed to do is magnetize the little bits of iron, and each one of those has stuck themselves together into these arcs, which are coming from one end of the magnet to the other end of the magnet. I have a simulation of that, so I'll just show that to you now. So uh, here we've got the two ends of the magnet. You remember, I'll talk to you about why in a minute if you don't, but you remember that we refer to the opposite ends of the magnet as the North Pole and the South Pole. That's why it's labeled with an N and an S in the simulation. And you can see that each one of these tiny little white and red arrows is representing a tiny little piece of iron filing. And each one's become a tiny little magnet, which is why the two ends have been covered indifferently. And they've been stuck together um, nose to tail, nose to tail, nose to tail, as we arc from one end of the magnet to the other. We could even take one of these little bits of iron, and we could grow it up a little bit and make it a little bit bigger, and we could put it on a pivot, and then we could pick it up and move it around. And that's called a plotting compass. And you can see that the red end of that magnet always points towards the south, and the white end over here always points towards the north. Okay, so um, let's have a little divergence from a second about why we refer to this as a uh, as poles, north and south. So uh, why do we do that? So you will remember that if we do take, uh, hang on a minute, one of these magnets, 
and we let it spin freely. So here's one that I've just put in some water. Uh, I've had to put it all the way over here, away from the rest of the desk, because um, any metal work in the desk messes this up. So I've picked a bit of desk that doesn't have any metal work under it. If I just put this in a random direction, you'll see that it's just free to float and it reorients itself in a particular direction. Um, and this kind of direction, this is the north-south direction of the Earth. Over there in that direction is the North Pole, and over here is the South Pole. So the question is, um, why is that? So you remember that the Earth um, is a sphere, and it's uh, rotating on its axis. And so the axis of rotation defines a kind of natural top to the Earth and a bottom to the Earth, or other way around, if you prefer. Um, but two, two locations on the planet um, are, are, are opposite ends. Now, these points where the axis pokes out of the planet is called the North and the South Pole, uh, and they're the geographical North and South Poles. Um, but very, 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 very near to them is a place that the magnets are pointing to. Um, if you don't know that the, the point that the magnets are pointing to isn't actually identical to the geographical North Pole and the geographical South Pole, and the magnetic poles of the Earth, they do move around ever so slightly um, over a period of, uh, say, over decades, you would notice them moving, and that can be plotted, and you can um, you can pull up data on the internet about where the North Pole, the magnetic North Pole, and the magnetic South Pole have been over the last couple of decades as we've been charting it. Um, but we can also use uh, evidence from uh, geological studies of rocks um, to work out where the North Pole and the South Pole were in the past. And over periods of tens of thousands of years, they actually go on quite an adventurous little move. And there is some evidence to suggest that uh, at some point in the distance past, the, um, the magnetic North Pole was around the equator somewhere. So the North and South Poles, they do move around. They are produced by the core of the Earth, which is predominantly iron. And the core of the Earth will be spinning largely in the same direction that the Earth is spinning in. And this gives rise to not only the magnetic field of the Earth, but also its orientation. So it's not a coincidence that the uh, magnetic poles are aligned with the rotational poles of the Earth, but it doesn't have to be that way, and it can vary um, over periods of time. Okay, so uh, what we have got going on here then is if I take um, a magnet, which we might as well stop calling them red and blue and start referring to them as north and south. So quite often they have little N's and S's drawn on them. So if I were to take my north uh, and south and attach it to a little piece of string and maybe tie it around my, my, my neck like a necklace, which maybe is what Vikings used to do when they were navigating across the seas all those years ago. And this thing will naturally rotate around, but if I just let it settle, it will settle in this kind of orientation where the north pole of the magnet is aligned with the geographical north pole of the Earth. You may remember, of course, that this is um, a little bit of an embarrassing mistake because the only way that the north pole of this magnet can be aligned with the geographic north pole of the Earth is if the geographic north pole is actually a south pole to attract it together. So uh, we don't like to mention that too much in too loud a voice because it is slightly embarrassing. Um, but here we have the simulation of it. If I go find that for you. So here's the, uh, the Earth. There isn't a bar magnet inside it as such. Uh, there's just a whole um, 
zone within the center that's that's believed to be predominantly iron and it's um, producing the magnetic field. So as we move the, the compass, as we call these little bits of uh, iron that have been magnetized and can float around, um, it will point towards the North Pole because there is a magnetic South Pole beneath it. And then if we take it round to the equator, um, it's kind of horizontal to the ground, uh, pointing towards the, the, the North Pole still. And as we bring it back down to the other end, we've now got the magnetic south of the compass is pointing at the geographic south of the Earth because there is a magnetic north uh, pole aligned because of the core of the Earth. All of these ideas that I'm talking to you now, by the way, they are just revision of what you studied at GCSE. Just in case your mind has gone a little bit hazy, there's nothing new here. Um, and if it is feeling like it's brand shiny new to you, like I said, you might want to have a little look at the GCSE revision guide at the end of the lesson that is attached to the uh, Google Classroom post. Okay, so back to the, uh, the field. Let me stop that. So this characteristic shape of these arcing lines of the magnetic field, these are directly comparable to the field lines of the electric field. So um, we can have a quick comparison of the two. Let me just switch my camera again. So when we met the electric field, we had um, field lines that were kind of like aligned like this. And that was a radial field for a point charge. And if that was a positive point charge, then the field would radiate out from it by convention. But we would ask what direction would the force push in on a positive charge, positive test charge. However, this field isn't like that because this field's got two bits to it. So it's actually a little bit more like this kind of field, isn't it? Where we had a positive charge and a negative charge, and these field lines looped around and joined the two up. So it is looking a little bit like that, but it's not like that um, close up. When you look really carefully at the field lines of the bar magnet, it doesn't quite have the same shape close enough as it appears to be. These lines are not behaving in the same way. And so tempting as it would be to believe that this thing and this thing were directly comparable and that we could do what we did for gravity or from gravity where we modeled the electric field on the gravitational field. And so maybe there's this possibility that we could model the magnetic field on the electric and the gravitational fields. But the reality of it is that when you when you study them closely, although they have some similarities, they're not closely enough um, analogous that you can just say, oh, that that is just like this. The shape of the lines are different, <coughs> even though there is some similarity. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to start fresh. And even though I began by saying that there were some uh, similarities with electrostatics, there are plenty of differences as well. So for instance, uh, here we've got a positively charged object and a negatively charged object, and they're, they're separate objects uh, with some kind of insulation in between them, or at least the, a, a vacuum. Um, that's not what's happening here. Uh, what we've got here is a solid object made of lots and lots and lots of atoms, and each one of those atoms is electrically neutral overall. And so, um, it's not the same as this in terms of 
um, either the net electric charge or the distribution of the electric charge. Um, this is a continuous object. And in fact, if you were to uh, take yourself a hacksaw and chop that thing in half, thinking you'll get a red end and a, a blue end so that you can have a, a north all on its own and a south all on its own, like you could here with positives and negatives, separate objects. You can have a positive object and you have a negative object. If you chop this thing down the middle, uh, hoping to get yourself just a North Pole and just a South Pole, you're going to have a surprise because all that will happen is when you chop it off, uh, this end will remain a North Pole, but then you'll create a new South Pole where you made the cut, and that'll become a new North Pole where you made the cut to go with the existing South Pole. So um, you can't have, it would appear, a North Pole all on its own and a South Pole all on its own in the same way that you can't have uh, a coin, there's heads and tails, you can't have a head without a tail, you can't have a front without a back, a top without a bottom, a left without a right. Um, these are just labels for opposite ends of an extended object. And if you chop the object in half, it's still got two ends. You've just got two objects with a pair of ends now. So it's not like this. And in actual fact, uh, in all of the experimental um, investigations that have been done, people have pl spent plenty of time searching for what are known theoretically as magnetic monopoles, a North Pole all on its own, like a, a particle um, floating through space that, that has some kind of innate Northness to it. Um, those particles have been theoretically conjectured, but they've never been discovered. There's no experimental evidence for these theoretical objects at all. And it is believed um, that they don't exist, that um, North and South always come together because they're opposite ends of the same object. OK, so we're going to have to stop referring to magnetism as a direct analogy to electric fields. So um, if you thought that maybe we were going to just do what we did for, for the electrostatics and just model it on gravity, we're not going to do that. We're going to have to start afresh with magnetism. Um, and it does beg the question, um, if the electric force exists because it's an innate property of um, electric charge, but there doesn't appear to be a north charged particle or a south charged particle, then what is a north and a south pole? Because it doesn't appear to be the same as positive and negative charge. It's not an innate property of a material. What is this northness and southness? Um, why does this end of an object attract itself to the uh, oppositely magnetized end of a different object? Why is that? What's happening there? So let's uh, take our clue from the Earth. So um, I'll just bring it over to this camera. The thing that's happening with the Earth that's important is not only does it have a solid iron core, um, but the Earth is rotating. And it's the rotating that turns out to be important because after many years of studying magnetism, it's now become clear that it's the rotation or the movement of particles that is the origin of magnetism. Um, but it's not any old particles. So um, if I just, again, switch back to the other camera. So here are some random materials that I've just found lying around in my drawer. <coughs> so if I bring the magnet nearby, um, some of these materials uh, respond to the magnet. So um, there's a steel screw, um, and it stuck itself to the north end of the magnet. Um, but here's an interesting thing. It also sticks itself to the south end of the magnet. Um, here's some coins. They don't appear to do anything at all with either end of the magnet. Um, there's a 2P. Um, interesting about this 2P, though, 
Um, turns out that in the uh, early 90s, we changed how we made 2Ps in Britain. So um, before the early 90s, they were largely bronze. Um, but after the early 90s, we switched to uh, copper-coated steel. So actually, the difference between these 2Ps is their age. Uh, this one's sort of something like 1972 on it, and this one's 1997, I think. Yeah, 1997. So uh, this one's actually steel. Look the same, made of different materials. Um, there's a one Newton uh, uh, slotted mass, 100 grams, uh, also made of steel. And then some aluminium doesn't appear to be affected that at all. Um, but then if we take these two objects that were both magnetic, they're not sticking to each other. Um, so both of those objects will stick to the magnet, but they won't stick to each other without the magnet. Um, doesn't make a difference to each other. So we have this deeper issue with magnetism um, to separate it further from the electric force. If you're an electric, uh, electrically charged particle and you have positive charge, then there's no escaping the electric force for you. Um, you will always have your own electric field and you will always respond to other electric fields. Um, because electric charge is an innate property of material, uh, of particles, it's always uh, in play. What we're having uh, to acknowledge with the magnetic field here is that some objects just can't experience the magnetic force at all. <coughs> so you might think to yourself, well, that's kind of analogous to neutral objects that don't have any, any charge. But then we have to factor in the fact that even objects that can experience the magnetic force um, don't naturally have a magnetic field of their own. And so we still have to ask the question, where does the magnetic field come from? Because it doesn't appear to be straightforwardly a materials thing in the same way that uh, electric charge is a, an innate property of material. OK, so um, again, it's the Earth that's giving us the clue and that movement thing again. So we can ask, is there some inherent movement going on inside some of these objects that is resulting in uh, magnetism permanently in some materials, magnetism temporarily in other materials, and just not possible in some other materials? Um, could it be a movement thing? And you hopefully remember from GCSE that that's exactly what it is. So um, let's go on to our next demonstration again. Hopefully you remember this from GCSE. So uh, what we've got going on here is that there is a piece of wire just, just suspended vertically here, a little piece of copper. And that piece of copper has just been attached to these two uh, terminals, which goes back to that power pack over there. So all I'm going to do in a second is run uh, an electric current down this piece of wire. And I've deliberately put the piece of wire vertically um, because my little tiny compasses are horizontally mounted. So I've just put all around the piece of wire all of these little compasses. Now, they're not very well behaved, these tiny little compasses. Um, they do tend to affect each other. They're not really designed to be used um, with so many of them so close to each other. Remember, each one of these tiny, tiny little pointers is a tiny, tiny magnet. And each one is trying to respond to the magnetic field of the Earth. And they're trying to line themselves up north to south. And you can see largely they're kind of managing it, especially if I bang it around a little bit so they move on their pivot slightly. And you can see that most of them are kind of pointing in that kind of a direction over there. <coughs> Don't worry too much about which end's been painted red and which one hasn't. They're quite cheap and not all of them have been had the right end of them pointed, uh, painted. Um, but you can see that they are aligned largely in this 
sideways across direction um, side to side. Now, what we're going to do now is just have a little look at what happens when I put a current through the uh, the wire vertically. So all I'm going to do is turn on the power pack, and you just need to have a look to see if the compass is moved. So if I just put that so you can try and get a lot of light out of the way, ceiling light. OK, there we go. Uh, so here we go. It's turning on. And then off again. So I can't leave it turned on for very long because the power pack uh, gets upset. I'm kind of short circuiting the power pack to get a high current. Uh, it works better with a high current. So you can see at the moment we've got the compasses are kind of pointed uh, in this kind of a direction. And what we're going to do is just turn it on. And now what I want you to look at is that these compasses are now going in a kind of circular pattern around the wire. If you could just look at them going round and round and round the wire. I'm just going to turn that off again before the power pack gets upset. Actually, if I don't tap it, hopefully they'll never come back on me. Okay, so what's uh, the shape of this magnetic field? <coughs> okay, so that's what the magnetic field looked like before. Um, when it was a bar magnet. So what kind of a magnetic field are we going to draw now? So rather than draw it three-dimensionally, it's kind of conventional to pretend that the piece of wire is sticking out of the board. So this is kind of a, a top-down picture on a magnet that's lying horizontally on the piece of paper. We're now going to take a, a top-down view of what I just showed you. So in the top-down view, you have the piece of wire, um, which we'll just represent as a circle. And that piece of wire was sticking vertically out of the, the board in the top-down view. And then we just need to have some kind of convention about whether the current is traveling downwards or upwards. So is it coming out of the page towards you, or is it going into the page away from you? So um, what I want you to imagine is that we've got a kind of arrow arrangement, and the arrow has got these little fletchlings on the end of it, which are sticking out there. And the other end of the arrow is just a pointy bit that's going to stick into something, like you've just whittled the end of a piece of wood. Um, and so the arrow obviously flies in that direction. And if you were looking at the arrow coming straight towards you, which probably wouldn't be a very nice experience, you would just see uh, a point. So when you see a dot in the middle of the circle, that represents the point of the arrow coming towards you. So this is coming out. This is a, a current coming out of the board. Um, whereas if you looked at the other end of the arrow, uh, you'd be able to see the fletchlings uh, disappearing away from you. And they're arranged in a kind of X formation on the back of the arrow. So that would be going away from you into the page. And this is coming out of the page. So you just need to remember that little bit of symbolism so that you can understand the diagrams as we draw them. But regardless of whether it's going in or out, uh, the porting compasses are lined in a circular pattern around it. And so rather than having uh, these arcing shaped field lines, we've actually got concentric circles based upon the uh, the the line, the line of the current. So, again, this should be ringing bells from GCSE, um, and you shouldn't be surprised that a current carrying wire has a magnetic field around it, even though it's a copper wire not made of steel. So this isn't a materials thing. This is an electric current thing. 
And what's actually producing the magnetic field here is not the copper of the wire, but the moving electrons. And that's what I need you to remember from GCSE is the most important part of this lesson as a recap is that magnetism is actually related to electric charges, but it's not the Coulomb force, not straightforwardly the Coulomb force as we understood it. We studied electrostatics, which means that the electric charges are stationary. When we study electric currents, we're actually studying electrodynamics. Electric charges are moving. Dynamic means to move. And so what we're actually seeing here is that magnetism, as demonstrated by the um, effect on the plot encompasses, magnetism appears to be not an electrostatic effect, but maybe an electrodynamic effect. But when charges move, what we call the magnetic force uh, comes into existence in their vicinity. That we have just studied maybe only half of what we needed to. But when we studied the Coulomb force, that was what charged particles do to each other when they're stationary. What we're starting to get a hint of here is that maybe charged particles can do something else, not when they're stationary, but when they're moving. Maybe the Coulomb force was only half of what electric charge can get up to. Um, in which case, we could then apply this on a huge scale to the core of the Earth. The core of the Earth is a planet-sized moving material which contains lots and lots of protons and electrons. And they're all in constant movement around the axis of the Earth. Maybe we could pin the magnetic field of the Earth to the movement of charged particles inside the Earth, which then brings us to these things. Is there anything going on inside here? Well, it's not plugged in. There's no electric currents inside um, what we would refer to as a, as a permanent magnet. But there is the orbiting of electrons around nuclei. And again, those are tiny, tiny, tiny little currents, um, tiny movements of charged particles. Maybe we could get to it from that for these things as well. In which case, we could then ask about how all of the movements of all of the electrons in this object are aligned compared to each other. So we would then start thinking about the difference between this and this. Remember that the screw can be magnetic, but it isn't magnetic all on its own. It doesn't stick. Um, all on its own, maybe that with the screw, whatever movement is going on with the electrons in here, it's just not quite organized enough inside this material. So that when there's a magnetic field around, the movement becomes organized and this becomes a little magnet as long as it is being organized by this stronger one. But then take away this stronger magnet and this thing is left becoming disorganized again in its internal movements. And I'm being deliberately vague here because magnetism is actually pretty complicated. And I just want to plant the seed in your head that maybe, possibly, what we've just learned about the magnetic field around a flow of electrons in a wire can be scaled up and made to be an explanation for the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetic field of this piece of steel, the temporary um, sometimes magnetic field of this piece of steel. And then maybe for things like this piece of aluminium, maybe we could then come up with some reason for why this can't be magnetized. Because whatever is able to occur all the time here, and sometimes here, can't occur at all here, which is why we've got 
uh, no effect at all on the piece of aluminium. So I'm just planting a seed today. You, you might not have studied the origin of magnetism very much at GCSE. So I'm just planting a seed and we're gonna come back to that next lesson. <coughs> okay, I am conscious of the fact that when we drew the pictures of the um, electric field, we had arrows on the lines to represent the direction that the force would either push or pull in. And by convention, we decided that we would draw the arrows uh, to, to show the direction of the force on a positive charge. Well, we're going to do something similar for the magnetic field. Um, and we're going to pretend that magnetic monopoles do exist, even though they don't. And we're going to ask what would be the force that was experienced by a north pole so um you can kind of get to it this way as well can't you that there really is a north pole here's a north pole with the south pole at the other end and as i try and push those together they're repelling away and therefore the arrows coming from here would push outwards because this north pole when it tries to come near to it is pushed in this direction it's pushed away from it the south pole on the other hand is um sorry wrong way this south pole here, what would be the effect on this north pole? Well, as it comes nearer and nearer and nearer, it gets pulled towards them. And so the force is inwards on a south pole and outwards on a north pole. So we can stick some arrows on these diagrams, outwards from a north pole, inwards to a south pole. And as a top tip to avoid messing this diagram up, I really would draw it just like I did. All of your arrows near to that North Pole, all of your arrows near to the South Pole, because the arrow that people screw up most commonly is these ones on the side. Uh, I think they try and think to themselves, um, well, I don't know what they think, but often this arrow is drawn in the wrong direction. So, um, that's a common mistake. So yes, yeah, stick your arrows at the ends and then you won't go you won't go far wrong. We can ask the same of this one. Uh, which direction would get would the North Pole be pushed in? And we can get that from the little plotting compasses. Um, and it turns out that uh, for this diagram, the North Pole gets pushed round and round and round in an anti-clockwise direction. But if we reverse the current and make it flow in the other direction, or you can think of it as just moving the camera so that it's instead of being above, it's now looking from below. So if you imagine that we're looking at this from above and we're seeing anti-clockwise arrows, and now we come around and look at it from this direction, when we look, if we place the camera to the other side of the whiteboard and looked at it like this would be, then we would see all these arrows spiraling in the other direction. So uh, these spiral clockwise. Now, this is just a convention that we ask what direction do the arrows point in, what direction would the force be on a north pole. It's just a convention to say on the north pole, just like it was for the electric force. But there is a, a, a difference going on here in that this is pointing from a North Pole towards the South Pole. And we know that North Poles repel North Poles. So we shouldn't be surprised that there is an outward force from this zone here. And we know that South Poles attract North Poles. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's an inward force here. But with the wire, there is no North and South Pole. So it's a legitimate question to ask, well, what is doing the repelling? If I place a North Pole there and it gets pushed this way, what is doing that? Why is it moving to the side? Um, and that's a question that we need to address uh, when we're trying to understand magnetism. Um, we we kind of get when there are poles, but the wire doesn't have any poles. So, the, and there's still a force. 
we need to come back to that idea and we need to ask what's going on for this, this um, wire arrangement here. But again, today's not about that. At GCSE, we just exposed ourselves to a lot of knowledge about magnetism and very little explanation about magnetism. And today's lesson is about recap. And I just want to finish off the recap and make sure that we remember everything from GCSE and the A-level explanation bit of what magnetism is and where it comes from and, and what's going on in all these different pictures. That is the A-level bit, and that's the bit that we're going to do next lesson. So let's do the last um, demonstration from GCSE, which, again, hopefully you remember. So let me move this camera again. <coughs> okay, so what's going on here is that I've taken a length of wire and instead of leaving it as a long straight piece of wire, I have coiled it up into a shape known as a solenoid, which hopefully is a word you remember from GCSE. So uh, what we've got here, we've got the power pack coming in here, and it's following uh, the wire, and it just starts coiling round and round and round and round until it gets to the other end, where it just carries on back to the power pack again. So this is, um, in everyday language, a coil of wire, but um, try to remember the word solenoid if you can. I'll write that on the board for you in a second, but it's S-O-L-E-N-O-I-D. -N -N okay, so again, we've got our little plotting compasses, and you can see um, that I've aligned them kind of through the middle of the coil and down the side of the coil. And I'll just try and move that again so the light's not in your way. There we go, that's kind of, I'm waiting to see the end actually. There we go. So you can see that these compasses, again, are pointing north-south with the Earth's magnetic field. And they're all largely pointing sideways in the image as you can see it. And what I'm just gonna do now is I'm gonna turn on the power pack and again, it's not going to work for very long, but we'll just hopefully see a change in direction of the compasses. The biggest change are these in the middle of the coil. So if you want to look there first. Uh, so here we go. Uh, on. So you can see that these in the middle of the coil are now lining up along the length of the coil. At the ends, it's spraying out of the coil. So coming away from the end of the coil. And then at the sides, it's traveling round to the other end of the coil. So you can see here we've got these arcs going on. And back at the other end of the coil, oh, there goes the power pack. Um, they were coming back in again at the other end. And so in actual fact, we've just uh, discovered that when we push the current through a coil of wire rather than just a piece of wire, it actually makes this pattern again, spraying out of one end, looping round and coming back into the other end, but more so now because this thing was hollow and we were able to put the little compasses inside it as well, what we found that we could see what was going on inside. And so if I just draw a coil in here. So there's the coil. And now what we have was that these lines were actually inside the coil as well, as picked up by the plotting compass. Now, 
it's not very easy for me to show you with with that um, piece of equipment um, because the, I can't put the compasses too near to each other because they attract each other. But what we do have inside the coil here are evenly spaced field lines. They're all pointing in the same direction and they're an equal separation from each other. And this is where we are going to remember what we learned from electric fields, that in this representation, the closeness of the lines gives us a direct um, measure of the um, strength of the force. And you can see here that the lines are very close together where the poles are. Uh, but here at the sides, they're very spread out. And that's why magnets, uh, they stick to things on their faces because that's where the force is strongest, but they don't stick to things on the sides because the force is very weak there. What you can see inside the coil here is that these evenly spaced lines not only represent a, a strong force, but also a uniform force. Um, like when we studied the electric field between two charged parallel plates and all of the lines were evenly spaced and that meant that the size of the force was the same at all locations between the, posi between the positive and negative plates. We've got the same thing going on here that we've got a uniform field inside the coil. It's not uniform outside the coil, but within the coil, all of these lines are parallel and they're evenly spaced. So we've got what we would refer to as a uniform magnetic field inside the coil. And in some of the things that we're gonna study in this topic, it's going to be useful to have a uniform field sometimes. And so lots of experiments that I'll refer to over the next few lessons are performed inside a very large radius um, solenoid so that we can pay, we can uh, take advantage of the uniform magnetic field that's inside uh, that shape. Okay, so um, just before we finish, time is it? Yeah, it's nearly time. I just wanna remind you of a couple of ways to remember which direction to draw the arrows in, because when it's um, a bar magnet and it's got an N and an S printed on it, then you don't have much of a problem working out which way is north and which way is south. But when you've got this wire that's just sticking out or sticking into the board, or when you've got a solenoid, which is just a coil of wire with a current flowing in it, the question is, how are you going to remember which way to draw the wire on? Um, I mean, you could just remember it, that X means clockwise and dot means anti-clockwise. You could try and fix that in your head but there are a couple of little things that you can do. And one of them involves your right hand. Um, and what you do is you pretend that your thumb is the wire and it's pointing in the direction of the current. And then you wrap your fingers around into a grip and your fingers are pointing in the direction of the arrow on the field line. So what you do is here, this is a current coming out of the board. So you push your thumb coming out of the board and your fingers are wrapping in an anti-clockwise uh, direction. Or over here, this is going into the board. So you push your thumb going into the board and your fingers are now wrapping in a clockwise direction. Over here, um, what we've got, oh, I forgot to put the current arrows on. Uh, okay. and it's coming up and up, up. Okay, so you can do exactly the same thing here with the solenoid. So you grab hold of this piece of wire here with your fist. And so your thumb becomes this arrow going upwards. And now you can see that your fingers are coiling around the back of the wire and pushing into the coil. Whereas over here, if you grab that piece of wire, um, your thumb going down, you can see your fingers are now pointing outwards from the coil 
And so that's why your arrows are coming out the other way. So this is called the right hand grip rule. Now, unfortunately for you, there are a number of hand rules during this topic. And so the question ceases to become, can you remember, can you swap cross means clockwise for right hand grip rule? You then have to remember it's your right hand grip rule and not your left hand. Um, another way of thinking of it is when you undo a bottle top, um, if you rotate the bottle top that way, it'll go upwards. So some people like to think that here, this is the direction that they would twist the bottle top off in, that direction, and as they twist the bottle top off, it'll come upwards towards them, whichever works for you. But you do need to remember some way of knowing which direction to draw these arrows in. Okay. That's what I wanted to remind you about today. Um, all of it, every last bit of it, is GCSE revision, apart from the little seed I planted in your head about maybe, just possibly, magnetism can be explained by the movement of charged particles, and that maybe magnetism isn't a, a, a fundamental thing, the way that electric charges, maybe it's a consequence of what happens to the electric field when we move the electric charges. So apart from that little A-level seed that I planted in your head, everything else that we've done today is actually uh, GCSE revision.